Oh my god, hey, welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am a professional theatre critic, and this weekend I went to West End Live. West End Live is a huge annual event organised by the Society of London Theatre, and it features performances from most of the musicals currently playing in the West End, as well as a handful of upcoming shows, off-West End shows, regional shows. There is so much live entertainment to enjoy, and it's a fantastic way of musical theatre fans being able to see some incredible performances all for free. But as well as that, West End Live is a huge PR and marketing opportunity for these shows to try and sell as many tickets as possible to these musical theatre fans. So today I'm going to be talking through every single show that performed at West End Live and giving you my review of the performance. If they were on the Saturday it's because I saw it in person and if it was on the Sunday it's because I have watched on YouTube. Which you can as well if you want to see any of these performances head over to Official London Theatre's YouTube channel and you can watch them for yourself. So we're going to be talking through all the details not only performances but song choices, costuming, choices, presentation, which shows stepped up their game from previous years, and which shows weren't quite performing on the same level that we might expect. The answers may surprise you. FYI, I have absolutely no idea how long this is going to take. We're going to run through them chronologically. So the Saturday morning started with Disney's Frozen and The Lion King. This was just before I actually made it into the arena. We were still queuing up at this point, but I've watched both of them back on YouTube. And for Frozen, they started with For the First Time in Forever, which I think is a great way to kick off an open West End Live. If you're not going to have Lion King go first and do Circle of Life, if you're going to have Frozen go first, I think they picked the perfect song to do that. And it's a great feature of Emily Lane, who has recently taken over as Anna in Frozen. She was joined by Samantha Barks, who got a big entrance applause, who did her little moment as Elsa in that song. And then they brought out the full company, which I was not expecting. Granted, I should have seen this coming, because that's the way that the stage version of this song ends. But that was really cool to me, that they had the whole Frozen company. They weren't in costume, and they weren't wearing themed t-shirts, but they were kind of loosely disney Disney bounding with like frosty vibes. Except for Emily Lane as Anna, who was wearing nice florals. And while I think that there is definitely more that Frozen could do, you know, it's not hard for them to get down the strand to West End Live. They could bring out Sven, they could bring out Olaf, they've done that in previous years. I think this number was a strong choice, so much so that it really overshadowed what happened next, which was Samantha Bark stayed on stage to sing Dangerous to Dream. And it's a lovely song, it's a moving song. But after the impact of For the First Time in Forever, I just don't know if it really held up. It was a slightly weird choice in that moment. I'm not saying they have to do Let It Go or Monster. I I think given the circumstances, they probably could have just done for the first time in forever because they'd already featured Sandbox in that one. Then we had The Lion King. They gave you Circle of Life because they have to give you Circle of Life. This is just obligatory. I'm all for shows changing things up and doing different songs in each year, but Circle of Life is just such a moment. They also did a little bit of He Lives In You. I liked the performances. I liked that they did something that's really authentically from the stage version of The Lion King where you will find that song. And consistently, they are just a great choice for really igniting this energy and this atmosphere at West End Live. Costuming wise, I do also think they could have done more, but they did what they've been doing the past few years, which is to have the opening of Act 2 costumes on and kind of like implying the vibes. They had some of the bird puppetry, but they didn't have any of the bigger puppets. I think bring out more puppets at West End Live. I think that would play really well. Next up was Wicked, and boy did Alexia Kadim sound fantastic singing The Wizard and I. She wasn't all painted up green, as the Elphabas sometimes are, but she she was in a lovely green dress. Again, she's Disney bounding, even though it's not a Disney show, to tell you who she is, as if we don't know who Alexia Kadim is and who she's playing. And I'm so glad that they had Alexia performing at West End Live because she performed as Alphabet at West End Live back in 2009. 14 years ago, people, and she is back playing Alphabet once again. That's such a moment. Made even more special when she was joined on stage by Lucy St. Louis. They sang For Good together, which is the more practical of the Wicked duets to sing, because I guess if they were going to do uh, Loathing, uh, What Is This Feeling, they'd need the whole ensemble. Or they could just get the crowd to do it. I know the ensemble harmonies. I'm sure many of us did. But there's a more heartwarming message to For Good, and having the two of them exuding this love and sisterhood on stage as the first two black women to play these roles in the West End and simultaneously was hugely meaningful. Next up, from Wicked to The Wizard of Oz. They didn't really make a lot of that, but we had Georgina Onwara, again a woman of colour, playing Dorothy Gale. This is a big moment, and she sounds glorious. We only got Somewhere Over the Rainbow, but she was costumed, which I appreciated. And I'm pretty sure if you go back to my review video of this from when it was at the Leicester Curve, I did say that Georgina singing that song 
was my highlight of the entire show. She has a glorious voice. It's classic and contemporary when it needs to be, but just stunning. A wonderful performance. Um, and I I feel like I never needed to hear that song sung again because you've heard Somewhere Over the Rainbow sung so many times. Georgina makes it sound fresh and compelling, and I just love it. Next up was Moulin Rouge. Now, I think I was critical of Moulin Rouge last year for not giving us costuming. This year, their presentation was a little better for reasons I'll get into. They had Ben Richards, who's recently taken over as the Duke de Monroth. He was sort of introducing and narrating. He introduced the Lady M's, who did a trimmed down version of uh, Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? Lady Marmalade. That's the one. Hence, hence Lady M's. Great crowd-pleasing song. I love that one. I'm not about to complain, but... I just wish that they could have been in their costumes. I was recently at the West End Flea Market and there were performers there from Moulin Rouge in costume. And that was, that was like, they were stood there for much longer in direct sunlight. And I'm like, you can put them in costume for that, but you can't put costumes on for the stage of West End Live. I don't get why some shows are committing to this and some aren't. And it sounds like a frivolous thing I'm suggesting, but I think the costume design is so stunning in Moulin Rouge that that's another aspect of the show that you're selling. On a bare West End Live stage, you can't sell the glitz and the glamour of these gorgeous shows. And if you had the costumes, that would make that sales pitch a little bit better. What did make it a little bit better was following it up with Jamie Moscato singing El Tango de Roxanne. Perfect choice. I mean, there were lots of Jamie Moscato fans in the crowd since he's taken over in this role. Everyone has been talking about him singing this song. I do think he is the strongest Christian I've ever seen in the show. He gave us the vocal opt-up moment. It was gravelly. It was Jamie Moscato goodness. Everything that you would expect from his performance. He sounded fantastic. People really got into it. That was a show knowing their fan base and delivering them exactly what they wanted. Smart choice. Also very much tying in with why people have been telling me they want to go back and see Moulin Rouge. It has been all about going to see Jamie Moscato playing Christian and they would be correct to do so. Book those tickets, people. He's that good. Next up, we had Grease. Grease always plays well to West End Live because we all know those songs. We've all sung along to them in a school disco or a gay bar somewhere at some point in our lives, weddings. And I'm going to say this a lot, but when you have that bigger crowd, the shows that do well are always going to be the ones where people already know the music and are dancing along and singing along. Grease not only gives us already known songs, but there was crowd choreography people could do as well with Grease Lightning. Now that's no longer even in the show, but they were doing it nonetheless. They did have some sound issues with the levels, with the backing track at the beginning of their performance, but I'm not about to dock marks for that, because Western Live is a very challenging sound setup. Every year, someone will get caught out by this. It's happened to Cinderella before, it's happened to Choir of Man. The cast did very well to just persevere. I don't know if they could even tell that we weren't hearing the backing track, but it came in about halfway through Summer Nights, and then everything was fine. So they also did Grease Lightning, and I think the choreography for that and that dance break is one of the most compelling moments in this new production of the show. So again, a great sales pitch. I'm pretty sure seeing that at West End Live was what first made me excited to go and see the show before I'd seen it last summer. Then they did something I really wasn't expecting, which was they brought out Jocasta Almgill to sing There Are Worse Things I Could Do as Rizzo. Now, she is another fan favorite performer that people have been really talking about in this role. I think brilliant choice to bring her out. And people underestimate the appeal of that song because it's not in the big Grease mega mix that we're always hearing. It's not one of the really obvious ones. But as it turns out, people wanted to sing along to that one as well. People know the lyrics to There Are Worse Things I Could Do, and it's a bit of an anthem. A bold choice from Grease that really paid off. They again weren't wearing costumes, but they did the next best thing, which was to give everyone matching t-shirts. It makes them look like a crew or like a, like a kind of a daytime casual show choir. But at the very least, it's cohesive, and I appreciate that. Next up, we had Tina. Now, Tina always reigns supreme over West End Live. Jukebox musicals will always do well in this setting because everyone knows this music. Not only the musical theatre fans, but their parents that they've dragged along with them. Everyone knows this music and everyone wants to sing along, especially with a song like Proud Mary. That is always going to stir the audience into a frenzy. Now, it was Aisha Jawando and the cast of Tina a few years ago that convinced me I needed to go and see this show. Up until that point, I hadn't really been too interested in it, but the West End live performance changed my mind. And in fact, someone just commented on one of my Instagram posts that after seeing Tina performing at West End Live, they were now really interested in the show as well. That is what West End Live can do for a show. Because you have all of these musical theatre fans 
friends who have turned up to see other shows performing. Maybe they haven't come to see Tina, but with that great a performance, they will change their minds. And it was a great performance. Karis gave an amazing vocal, like phenomenal. The stuff she was doing at the end, so, so good. And it took on this new resonance, this profound new resonance, because of the recent tragic passing of Tina Turner. And there was a little bit of a moment at the beginning to pay tribute to her before singing The Best, which was a brilliant song given the circumstances. It all worked fantastic performance, one of the best. And at that point, I think it was the biggest audience reaction that I had heard that far in the day. Next up, a complete tonal shift for Crazy For You. Now, if I told you that jukebox musicals are always gonna do well, classic musicals are always going to struggle a little bit more at West End Live. It's just not the kind of music that will whip up an audience. But Crazy For You did their best. They did slap that bass, they gave us costuming, they gave us choreography. I think people who are interested in this show would really have enjoyed that performance. I think Crazy For You is a fantastic show. I do think there are maybe stronger numbers they could have performed at least musically, but I do give them a heck of a lot of props for bringing something that staged and choreographed to the stage of West End Live. Few other shows were committing that much in the staging department, and that's really what sells Crazy For You is the fantastic dance. I feel like the choice to do this number was probably made by balancing showing that dance and showing the ensemble while also featuring leading man Charlie Stemp. He's a big sales point to the general West End crowd because we know him from Half a Sixpence, from Mary Poppins. I wonder if there's a version in which they could have done a medley with one of his solo numbers from the show then leading into I Got Rhythm because I think that's just such, I Got Rhythm is the song that not only do I leave the interval singing that song and leave the show singing that song, but for weeks after I will have I Got Rhythm stuck in my head. I think that's such a fantastic melody that it probably would have played a little bit better. Next up was Cabaret, which really surprised me. They made some unprecedented choices because they have been very careful with their marketing and about how much they reveal now, as time has been passing, they have been revealing more and more about the elusive and mysterious Kit Kat Club. We never had original stars Eddie Redmayne or Jesse Buckley performing anywhere outside of the theatre. I think one of the first public performances from Cabaret was Amy Lennox at the Olivier Awards, who had just taken over as Sally Bowles. And then subsequently, we've had a few TV performances. This time last year was Cabaret's first time participating in West End Live, and they sent Emily Benjamin. It was a huge year for understudies last year, and people were really talking about Emily's performance of the song Cabaret. It was one of the strongest solo performances of the day and she really wowed people. Now this year they sent the brand new stars of the production, Mason Alexander Park and Maud Apatow, who have both taken over as the MC and Sally Bowles respectively. Mason was introducing Maud, who performed Don't Tell Mama with the female ensemble. I like that Cabaret are showing us more, but I don't think this had as much impact as Emily Benjamin's performance did last year. Simply because this is not one of the more well-known songs in Cabaret. Don't Tell Mama is not in the film. I think even if they'd done Mine Hair instead, there would have been a little bit more recognition. Also, the way Mine Hair is staged, they have microphones, and it would have felt more like a rock concert vibe than Don't Tell Mama, which didn't really translate well to the West End Live setting. Everything about Cabaret is sort of noir and dimly lit, and so doing it in the middle of the day in an arena in Trafalgar Square doesn't really work that well for the show, and they have to try and find a way of fitting the round peg of this show into a square hole. Another option would have been to have Maud Apatow do maybe this time. I've heard that this is one of the stronger moments of her performance in the show. I haven't seen either of them in the show yet. I'm hoping too soon. But I think while they both did a great job, and again, I like that it was in costume, I just don't think they really conveyed the power, the artistic power of that show on the West End live stage. I don't think it really worked for them. Next up, we have had the Book of Mormon. Only recently have the Book of Mormon started participating in West End Live because they were another one that were quite careful with their marketing early on. But we got two numbers from them this year. We got I Believe and we got Baptize Me. Two of the easier numbers to perform out of context and they don't need to bring as many of the ensemble members. We got costume, we got little bits of dialogue in between. Now this was controversial because we did get a little bit of an expletive moment in the middle of I Believe and West End Live is open to all ages. So I wonder how that might have gone down with parents of young children, but perhaps I'm being overly conservative and they'll get over it. Dom Simpson did a great job of performing I Believe and I really enjoyed Baptize Me. I do think that there are boppier songs 
in this show. I think if you look at the playlists of musical theatre fans, that the ones they're probably going to listen to more is going to be something like Two by Two, or You and Me But Mostly Me, or Hello. But I also think the issue with Hello is that whole section at the beginning and how free it is. And I think it would be impossible to perform along to a backing track. They would need to have a live accompanist and then you would only have the piano effect and you wouldn't have the full band. Whether they could do a piano accompaniment for that early section and then switch on to a track somehow. They could bring a conductor, other shows do. I think if they could find a way of making Hello work, then that would land a lot better or turn it off, but they wouldn't be able to do the clapping lighting effect costume change thing that they do in the theater. Lots to think about logistically when you consider which songs are gonna be performed at West End Live. Next, we had a trio of Cameron Mackintosh produced shows, starting with The Phantom of the Opera and its new star, Holly Ann Hull. She performed Wishing You Were Somehow Here Again. She did a fantastic job of performing this last year at Musical Con and she did a great job again at West End Live. They gave you full costuming with capes and they were one of the shows that brought a conductor to make sure that the cast was staying in time with the backing, which is a smart and sensible choice because like I said before, it is a difficult gig, West End Live. It's challenging for the performers. They're not really getting enough fold back necessarily. It's hard for them to hear themselves. It's all very difficult. But Holly Ann Hull sounded gorgeous and blessed Phantom of the Opera for being the show with enough enduring popularity that musical theater fans will get really excited about this music with a discernibly more classical vibe against all of the other contemporary stuff. Then we had All I Ask of You featuring alternate Christine. I love a show featuring their understudies and their alternates, especially alongside the principal performers, not just out of necessity, but to feature them both in different performances. I thought that was fantastic. And we had new phantom leading man, John Robbins. John Robbins, a West End favorite. He was on that stage last year as Jean Valjean with the cast of Les Miserables, and now he is the phantom in the Phantom of the Opera, singing the music of the night stirringly, passionately, and beautifully. Phantom have pulled out some gimmicks before and brought out like multiple different phantoms to sing music of the night together. Honestly, I think this works the best when you just give us the songs from the show in a pretty straightforward context. That's all they have to do. They don't have to overthink their performances. But costuming, very important for these shows. Very important. I don't think John Robbins could sing music of the night with just his normal face out wearing a t-shirt with the phantom mask on. I wouldn't get as into that. Next up, we had Les Miserables opening with their new star, Josh Pitterman, singing Bring Him Home. No, Lucy Jones was first. Lucy Jones as Fontaine singing I Dreamed a Dream. Again, another obvious winning choice because she's fantastic. She puts this slight kind of a pop slant on I Dreamed a Dream with her iconic option up. But there are dreams that cannot be. Only she sounds a lot better than I do. And she's another big fan favorite performer. Then we had Josh Pitterman singing Bring Him Home. It was beautiful. Again, I like that people care enough about this music to really give them enough stillness to deliver that kind of a song. On paper, you wouldn't think that this would work in this kind of a setting, but because it's beloved, it does. And then we had One Day More. They absolutely have to do One Day More. It whips the crowd into such a frenzy. Everyone is marching along and cheering and roaring. It's just a great number. And Les Mis does scale very well. I think it's better to have the full company come out marching together, waving a flag, doing One Day More than to just bring out a few performances performers and tease the idea of all of that. Throw it in our faces. Much better. Then we had Hamilton. Now this was a little bit curious because Hamilton have put on a bigger presentation in previous years. They've given us a medley of a couple of songs. They've given us like Skylar Sisters and My Shot and Alexander Hamilton. But this year we just had Joel Montague in costume as King George III and that's noteworthy that he was in costume because that is a warm, warm costume performing You'll Be Back. And though I miss having the fuller Hamilton cast showcasing what really makes that show individual and special, which is its sound, its contemporary music, and also the diversity of its cast. I think You'll Be Back is another musical theatre fan favourite. This is another one that is on everyone's musical theatre playlists. And before he'd even got to the everybody sing along part of the song, everyone was singing along to this song. Like, that was a moment. But not as much of a moment as John Montague finishing the song and then ushering everyone to look to the skies where Trooping the Colour was flying past overhead. So this was a military birthday parade of the Royal Air Force planes for King Charles III. And it coincided with the end of this Hamilton set beautifully and deliberately. Like this had all been carefully planned because it was always going to interrupt whatever was happening on the West End Live stage. So shout out to everyone who made that happen and shout out to West End Live for running on time so that we could get the magic of him being like, and now planes, 
whoosh. Back down to Earth, we had Rodgers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. Now, this revival has been polarizing in the theater. We know that some people really love it for its boldness and its freshness and its radical reinterpretation of the show. Some people hate it. Some people are walking out. People have been coming up to me at press nights and saying, how could you enjoy Oklahoma? I hated it. It has elicited very strong responses from theater goers. But I think generally more people were just excited about it at West End Live because they chose good songs. We had understudy Curly George Madison performing. He did a great job. We had two new cast members to the show, two recent additions, Paige Petty and Sally Ann Triplett, who have recently joined. We started with Paige singing I Can't Say No. They like trotting out this song. They did this on the Olivier's as well. In fact, they did this same combination of songs on the Olivier's where they did that into the title song Oklahoma. Paige did a fantastic job. She's replacing Georgina Onwara, who was left to do The Wizard of Oz. And she has quite a different vocal placement, especially at the bigger, higher parts of the song. Georgina was mixing in a very beautiful way. And Paige is just giving you this like raw, belting dynamism, which sounded thrilling. And then they went into the title song, Oklahoma. Smart of them to choose these like knee-slapping, crowd-pleasing songs. They did well, I thought. Next up, Aspects of Love, who to my mind made a really big error. And I'm not saying this just to dunk on Aspects of Love. I know I was very critical of that show in my review. I'm not gonna hate on them for not wearing the costumes in the show because I don't think it really matters because they're not iconic costumes or anything, but they had Jamie Boggio and Laura Pitt-Pulford singing Seeing is Believing. And if you didn't believe me about how many times they say that line in that song, now all of you who are at West End Live know for yourselves. They keep singing it over and over again. I mean, that will get it in people's heads, but what was everyone expecting them to do? Love changes everything. That is the song from this show and the reason people are booking tickets. Was Michael Ball simply not available to come and perform it? Was Dave Willits, the alternate George, not available to come and perform it? Why was no one singing Love Changes Everything? A, it's the most famous song, and B, it's this huge selling point to see Michael Ball sing it in the show. What is going on, people? Why would you not do that number? Jamie and Laura sounded great. It sounded lush and romantic, and it will have given people who don't know the show whatsoever a bit of a flavor of the show. It will have portrayed it in a very sort of romantic and sincere light. I suggest you go and watch my review so you can find out more about the plot before booking your tickets. But I am just mystified about them not doing Love Changes Everything. That would have sold so many tickets. Next up, we had Jersey Boys. Now, Jersey Boys know how to do West End Live, and it works so well for them because it's really recognizable tunes. Songs that you may not even realize you know until they start doing it, and then you're all there going ba da ba da ba da da da. Now, they varied up their set list a little bit this year. In previous years, they have given us such a well choreographed medley. I've always joked that they run through basically all of the songs from the show in their West West End live set. But this year we had slightly longer versions of only a few songs. We started with Begging and then we had the Jersey Girls come out. Now I appreciate this. I thought it was great that they feature the talented female ensemble performers from the show. Hey now, hey now, my boyfriend's back. That song goes on far too long in the show, but I liked it at West End Live. Now having said that, do I think that's the best sales pitch for the show? Not really. I like that they featured those performers. I think they're really talented. It's a fun number. Maybe that will make female musical theatre fans more excited about that show. It's revealing something people might not have realized about Jersey Boys, but for the most part what people associate with this show is the four guys in the red blazers singing the song, singing the Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons songs, doing the choreography, and we missed a little bit of that, I think. We still had some other songs from them as well, and we still had You're Just Too Good To Be True, so we had the crowd-pleasing hits, but I do think this medley that they've done in previous years is a tighter sales pitch for the show. Perhaps they just don't want to give as much away. I don't really know. Oh. Then we had Operation Mincemeat, and this is where I get conflicted because I'm so thrilled that Operation Mincemeat got to perform at West End Live. I know this must have meant so much to them, and there were some really enthusiastic fans there, and it was fantastic to see them on this stage alongside these other huge shows. They were all there in costume, and they had this little bit of a preamble where they were doing some dialogue uh, to try and establish context for the song that they were going to perform. And the song that they chose to perform was God That's Brilliant, which is a great song, especially about halfway through. It really switches into this gear when we get to Hitler's on the train and he's feeling kind of better. That's a great part of the song. 
and it's funny and it's witty and they keep going back to making jokes about Ian Fleming. So they had to do a lot of dialogue at the beginning to establish this and clarify that everyone in the West End Live audience realized that that was who that was and set up the jokes that they were going to make in the song. The problem with this is the dialogue went on for about twice as long as it needed to. We got it and then they just kept riffing on this idea to really try and hammer it in. Now, if there's one thing that doesn't work at West End Live, it's witty comedy songs with lyrics that we need to be able to hear clearly and probably already know in order to laugh at the jokes. Unfortunate, the untold story of Ursula the Sea Witch has struggled with this in the past. It didn't land very well at West End Live and it kills at the Edinburgh Fringe. Ultimately, what I think Mincemeat did wrong was they just performed the wrong song. I loved it when they came out at the beginning and said, hello, MI5, and made jokes about that. But what I think they ought to have done is performed the song Born to Lead, because in the show, this opens with almost no context whatsoever. They just open with the song, and we don't need a scene leading into it to work out what's going on. Or they could have given us one of the songs from the show that didn't rely so much on witty jokes. They could have given us Making a Man, Making a Hero. There's some great tunes in Operation Mincemeat, and they would have had to have come up with some sort of a cut because some of those songs are quite long but I think there's probably a better number they could have settled on rather than God That's Brilliant. They could even have done a mincemeat megamix opening with Born to Lead, little bit of dialogue with some underscoring leading into God That's Brilliant, then go into something else. We could have featured a bunch of the songs from the show and it does sound like a lot of work because it is a lot of work. But when you have this great an opportunity to sell tickets to prospective musical theatre fans, many of whom will not know about this show at all and will be seeing it and hearing it in that setting for the very first time, I think it's worth putting the work in. And this is no criticism of the cast. I thought they gave great performances. They did exactly what they needed to do. It just didn't highlight the show in the best light. Then we had Mamma Mia. I am always tickled when they have this dramatic introductory music and the ensemble come out and take their formation poses. But Mamma Mia is another one. Crowd-pleasing songs. I mean, ABBA is party music, isn't it? It's the middle of the day, the sun is shining, we're all waving our arms. They did Money, Money, Money. They did Waterloo. They did Mamma Mia. All of that works. All of it works. I do miss Maz Murray just knocking it out of the park with the winner takes it all. She did that one year at West End Live and absolutely killed it. I would love to get to hear her do that song again, but everything that they did worked. And she managed to pull off a really fast costume change from her Donna dungarees into the Super Trooper outfit at the end. So when some shows don't even come in one costume, Maz Murray's wearing two with Mamma Mia, come on now. Putting you to shame. Then we went from Greece to Italy with Glory Ride, a new musical currently playing at the Charing Cross. I went to review this back when it was opening. You can see my little review reel on my Instagram or TikTok feeds. But this featured leading man Josh St. Clair and the cast, giving us a little bit of a flavor of the show. And I think what really came across was epicness. People got the vibe that it was sort of similar to a Les Mis kind of a sound and kind of a show. I give props to Glory Ride for being there at all because they were performing in the two o'clock slot and they had a two 30 matinee. Now this is a musical about a Tour de France winning cyclist, but that is still impressive time for them to make going from one stage back to the other. It's always going to be a tough sell for a new musical to land songs that people do not know at West End Live, but I thought they did a pretty decent job. Then we had the Choir of Man. Now the Choir of Man has become something of a West End Live staple. They've performed a few years in a row now, and they did the same set that they have done in the past, the same combination of songs. It gives opportunities for audience sing-along. They get to do their little glass mugography that they do. There's some thrilling vocal moments. The vibe of the show comes across very well, and I think Western Life is a great opportunity for Choir of Man to convince a lot of people to become interested in the show. They did so, so well. It sounded fantastic. They've had sound issues in previous years, none on the Saturday. People were singing along, people were shouting along and fist pumping and clapping in the air. This was the most excited I had seen the crowd the entire morning. This then overtook, I think, as the biggest audience response to any of the performances. Then after Choir of Man, we had Six. Now Six has been such a West End Live success story. They started out in their very first appearance. It was pre-Edinburgh Fringe. People weren't sure what to make of the show. They weren't in costume and it didn't really land all that well. They were still in rehearsals and they hadn't really found their groove. They then returned to West End Live the next year as a popular London show with a huge fan base and they got this enormous audience response. In previous years, they have done both Saturday and Sunday, and they've given us different combinations of queens on both days. They've given us different numbers. This year, interestingly enough, they were only doing the Saturday, and they didn't wear costumes. 
Like, they had six t-shirts, which is fine, but Gabriella Slade's costume design for six is so good and newly Tony Award winning, these costumes are iconic. I don't know why they don't feature them. Because they've worn the costumes in previous years, I don't get why this decision was made. And they also made a little bit of a puzzling decision about song choices. They did House of Holbein, which is really fun, that turned it all into a rave briefly, and then they debuted this new version of Heart of Stone. It was sort of a club remix moment, it sounded fantastic and it was intriguing, but I think they ought to have just given us a little bit more of an introduction to explain what it was, because they literally just said, and now for something very different, and then Club Remix Heart of Stone happened. And people were kind of coming to terms with it and like vibing and getting into it over the course of the song. Like, yeah, we can get on board with this. But even if they just had like a little video clip from uh, Toby Marlowe and Lucy Moss explaining what it was, or just even if they just said a little bit more about it or said like, and this is dropping today and you can now go and stream this on Spotify. I just didn't really get what it was. Is it launching that version of the song as a single? Was it just a West End Live exclusive? What was that about? And then they finished with the Mega Six. Now I love the Mega Six. The Mega Six is fantastic. It's a brilliant marketing tool that they perform every night at the end of the show in the West End. But for West End Live, I don't know why they wouldn't do six. Like I said, I like when shows come back year after year and do slightly different songs. But just like I said, Les Mis have to do One Day More. I feel like six have to do the song six because it has the crowd choreography. One of a kind, no category. Two, many years, all that stuff. People get into it. As soon as you hear that little ukulele introduction to the song, the crowd goes wild. I think people were a little bit confused as to why they didn't perform six. Certainly I was confused. It's still six, it's still really popular. Anything they do from that show is gonna get a huge reaction out of that crowd, but they could have gone bigger. Then we had a show called Divas London. Now it's always difficult to be the first show that's not a big West End musical because you get this point in the afternoon where they all have to go off and do a matinee. So invariably the performances that you will get will be from other shows that either aren't playing right now or are smaller shows that are trying to promote different events. Divas London is an upcoming drag show featuring iconic music divas. They performed numbers like Hot Stuff and Total Eclipse of the Heart and What a Feeling from Flashdance, and then they ended with Proud Mary. Now, I just wish that there had been a little organization between the acts to establish that Proud Mary was already going to have been performed by Tina earlier that morning. But it also doesn't take communication between the shows to figure out that Tina are gonna be doing Proud Mary. They do Proud Mary every year. So to have a song repeated just a couple of hours later was a little bit of a confusing moment for the audience. People still got into it, it's still Proud Mary, we're still gonna dance, but it's like being at a wedding and the DJ decides to play it twice. You kind of assume it's only happening because a drunken aunt has requested it. They did this audience call and response thing, when I say divas you say London, and it's a good way of making sure that the name of the show really lands in people's heads and they get what you are selling, but the whole vibe of it wasn't really suited to afternoon musical theatre fans, it was more of like a suggestive late night cabaret entertainment kind of a vibe. Although having said that, next up was Magic Mike Live. Magic Mike Live do the same thing at every single West End Live performance and it always gets a big reaction for obvious reasons. I like that they're actually clothed for so much of it and that it does feature contemporary dance and it shows that the Magic Mike Live, the show, is about all of that. It's about much more than what people might think that it's about. And it's certainly a big explosion of energy when they have this big finale and they take their shirts off and they're climbing the side of the stage and they're throwing fake money. I think I still have some of it somewhere. But like I said, big crowd response. They know what they're doing. They know what their marketing avenues are. And, and they join up all of the dots to make that happen. Then we had Roles Will Never Play. Now there was a slightly ropey introduction to this by two of the cast members from the play that goes wrong, which I think is a nice idea. It's nice to have a little bit of synergy there. And I think that was a great way of including the play that goes wrong. They're obviously not a musical, so it's not like they can do a set and perform a musical number. I just think they could have done something a little bit funnier. They relied on, aren't these characters silly and saying a lot of musical puns? rather than doing an introduction that went wrong in a more of a familiar mischief kind of a style. But the actual performance from Roles Will Never Play, I really enjoy this part of a West End Live because you get all of these really talented performers doing songs that you wouldn't expect, doing songs that they wouldn't normally get to perform, but they're also performed with so much passion and enthusiasm because you get these performers singing songs that they really love, but this is the only chance they're going to have. Every single performer, a vocal powerhouse, just brilliant and exciting. I don't know if they really hammered home what it was that they were advertising and selling in terms 
terms of this kind of recurring concert series, but it was a really fun part of West End Live to watch. Then we had Matilda. Now I want to talk to you about Matilda's performances from both days because they performed on the Saturday afternoon and the Sunday. Now on the Saturday afternoon, we got Naughty. We've had this at West End Live many a time. I like that it's become an audience sing-along song. That never really used to happen with this. And I think it's on the back of the film's success that people now sing along with Naughty, which is great. It goes to show what a big commercial film adaptation can do for a musical. Now on the Saturday, this was taking place while Matilda's matinee would actually have been happening. And what we had was one of the Matildas who wasn't in the show that day performing Naughty. But I literally said to Aaron, if only they could bring out Lauren Byrne to sing My House. Now I don't believe they've ever done My House at Western Live before, but guess what? They did it on the Sunday. They brought out Lauren Byrne. They understood what fans wanted and that Lauren Byrne has become such a fan favorite on the back of her performances in Six and Cinderella and her Instagram famous Harmony Heavy Girl group, Remember Monday. So they brought her out as Miss Honey singing My House. And again, just like Jamie Muscato is a great reason for people to go back to Milan Rouge, Lauren Byrne is a great reason to go back to Matilda because she sounds phenomenal as Miss Honey. Getting to watch it on YouTube and seeing the close-ups of her face and all of the subtleties in her acting, heartbreaking and the belting moments at the end just sensational i'm so glad that they realized what a good idea it would be to bring her out and have her sing that song so after matilda on the saturday we had another show that performed on both days this was the little big things this is a musical coming to at soho place later this year and they just gave you the one song performed by cast members some of whom will be appearing in the show and some of whom i think participated in a workshop or just like a demo recording of some of the music now they were giving you the title song Song, the little big things and there was a definite Dear Evan Hansen, Pasek and Paul kind of a vibe to it but Dear Evan Hansen has now closed in the West End. Many people were saying that they missed Dear Evan Hansen performing at West End Live so this kind of fills a vacancy that has appeared in the West End in many ways. I don't want to sort of make a broad comparison of the score until I've gone to see the show but I think of the completely new musical theatre songs that performed at West End Live this was probably one of the most impactful because it's that very new contemporary uplifting style like a Dear Evan Hansen, and I think it got a lot of people very interested about this show, which is exactly what it was supposed to do. Obviously, they weren't in a position to give you something fuller with staging or costuming because the show is not opening yet, but I think they used the West End Live opportunity to the best of their ability and did very, very well. Then we had Annie Get Your Gun. Like I said, classic things don't fare quite as well, but they performed There's No Business Like Show Business and educated a whole lot of people about this being the show that that song is actually from. Then they had their leading lady, former Eurovision entry for the UK, Suri, who will be playing Annie Oakley. She performed You Can't Get a Man With a Gun. It was a funny number. She was giving you so much character. I think she's going to be fantastic in this show was my main takeaway from it all. But I do think it went on just a little bit too long and it's another one with like old timey witty lyrics. I wonder if anything you can do I can do better might have been a better choice. Another show that performed on both days was La Bamba. This is another new musical and it's a jukebox musical and they performed slightly different sets on the two days but mostly featured the same couple of numbers and I think they depicted a decent breadth of the show's tone. They gave us a good flavor of what it was going to be about. We got the dance element they went from this ballad into Shakira, and I think that shift really got everyone's attention. Later in the afternoon, there was also a performance from the upcoming Edinburgh Fringe show, I Wish My Life Were Like a Musical, which will also be performing in London. This is another one that features witty lyrics and comedy songs, but I think it fared a little bit better because they're not quite as fast. You don't have to work quite as hard to hear them and discern them, and they're all inside jokes about musical theatre, so they work well in this setting. They even had a song about musical theatre superfans that they performed to a crowd full of musical theatre superfans. So I think that worked pretty well for them. It was a good sales pitch of what that show is going to be about. I don't know if people really understood what the structure of the show was beyond these songs, but there isn't really much of a structure to the show beyond those songs, so that's really all that they can depict. I felt similarly about Then, Now, and Next. Next. This is an off West End musical. It's opening very, very soon at the Southwark Playhouse. And Alice Fern led the cast in performing a handful of songs. And I'm really waiting to see this in context because what I didn't get from this was the individuality of that score and of those songs. Nothing really stood out to me. Nothing has really settled and lasted in my mind. Dare I say it sounded a little bit generic. I don't know if giving us a handful of numbers was the best idea. I think maybe if they'd just done one to really highlight just Alice Fern singing this one song that might have made more of an impact. Sometimes less is more with these things and it might also prove more memorable. But the vibes I got from the show were a little bit if then, a little bit songs for a new world. 
and I just don't know if I was able to discern the specificities of that show's identity from their performance. What it did do was remind people that Alice Fern is going to be in an off-west end musical and they can get tickets, so it did its job in that respect. Then we had Lizzie the Musical. Now this one is opening at the Hope Mill and is then going on a UK tour led by Lauren Drew and I got energy and I got passion. I didn't love the songs. I don't know the score to this one. Again, possibly I would enjoy them a lot more in context. I preferred the end of their set to the beginning because it got more riotous and rebellious and angsty and anything that you can like have microphones and jump around and like engage with the crowd is going to work more in a West End live setting. It's more like a concert and where the music then it becomes more like a concert kind of a vibe, then it's gonna go better. Now that brings us to the end of day one. I have no idea how long you've been watching this video, but I have been sat here recording for an hour. Let's keep going. And I'm gonna tell you about what happened on the Sunday. So we opened Sunday with Heathers. Now in a previous West End Live, Heathers pulled this big stunt by having the touring cast and the London cast performing Candy Store side by side. I think it was tour in London. And this year they similarly had two trios of Heathers, but they were all from the West End cast because they were featuring their principal performers and their understudies, which was not a bad decision from an optics and PR point of view, because this is a show that has come under fire for not casting enough understudies. There's been a little bit of drama swirling around that, so I think featuring and uplifting their understudies on the West End live stage, good decision. We then had Miracle Chance and another of the show's understudies, Elliot David Parks, playing JD, performing the song at 17. There was a little bit of a lyrics flub, and I wasn't there listening to this live. I'm sure it sounded better live because the soundboard audio recordings of the West End live performances that go up on official London Theatre's YouTube page are honestly nobody's friend. But the vocals did sound a little bit strained. Elliot David Parks was going for it as JD with neck veins and head veins throbbing and popping. And I haven't seen Miracle Chance's performance in the show, but I just wanted a little bit more depth to her Veronica throughout the West End live performance. I felt like she was just kind of pulling the one same face. And I think she's got a fantastic voice. She has a beautiful and sweet vocal placement, but I don't know if it fits it's Veronica for me. Again, I would like to see her in the show to gain a fuller appreciation of her entire performance and not judge it based on one West End live outing. They did go from 17 right into I Say No, and a lot of people in the audience were very excited. They were clearly singing along to I Say No. I don't know if it makes much sense because those songs are so similar tonally and vocally to go straight from one into the other. I think it's an either or situation. In previous years, if I'm not mistaken, they've done Freeze Your Brain into I Say No or Freeze Your Brain into 17, but having 17 and I Say No, it seemed a little bit redundant to have those back to back. There's a lot of other great songs from Heathers that they could do at West End Live. They could do a Dead Gay Sun. They could do a Big Fun. I think they could push the boat out a little bit more if they are still in London this time next year for another West End Live. I think there's more interesting things that they could do that we haven't seen before from Heathers. Then we had 42nd Street. Again, difficult to be a classic musical, but they were very brave because they gave you a full tap number. Now that is the big selling point of this show. The tap is outstanding. It's astonishing. It's incredible the way they all perform it in unison. It's a fantastic ensemble of dancers. And so I'm glad that they featured that. I would love to have been in the crowd to really know how that went down. It's harder to tell from YouTube how that came across, but I think it was a great performance. They then had Adam Garcia and Josephine Gabrielle and the cast performing Lullaby of Broadway. It was a great moment. It's a great song. I think it will have really appealed to everyone who likes that genre and is looking for that kind of a show. If we're comparing that with Crazy For You, which are going for the same market, it's, let's be honest, I think probably 42nd Street just did a little bit of a stronger job. But then that show is already open and crazy for you. It's still getting ready for its first preview performance. Then we had a strange loop who had just had their first preview performance, which is probably why the cast were not available for West End Live. So we had writer Michael R. Jackson instead, which is a bit of a treat. Now there have been previous West End Lives where writers have sung their own material, especially for new musicals, and it hasn't gone well. But I think Michael R. Jackson did an earnest and engaging job of singing these songs. If I had been there, I would have been absolutely singing along because I love A Strange Loop and I hope that it did have some of its fans there in Trafalgar Square supporting that show. This one was always going to be a little bit of a difficult sell to that audience. There would be so many people who just wouldn't know this show. There would be so many great songs from the show that they can't perform because of adult content. But good on Michael R. Jackson for selling this because it was better than nothing to have this kind of an advertising opportunity for A Strange Loop. Yes, it would have been a better one if they'd had the cast available. They could have done intermissions 
Legend song, they could have done a slightly fuller vocal version of Memory Song. They probably couldn't have done Exile in Gayville. I don't think they're performing on the same stage a few weeks later for London Pride, but I would love it if they would, because they talk about such important issues to the LGBT community. I think we're probably just going to get like party anthems on the London Pride stage, and I would love to have a strange loop bringing an important conversation to the forefront using musical theatre. I have to keep going. Next up, we had Tarantino Live. I know nothing about Tarantino Live, and I started watching this thinking I don't even know that many Tarantino films. And then this reminded me, I've seen more Quentin Tarantino films than I thought I had. And this is a show that uses iconic music from the soundtrack of all of those films. I'm still not completely sure what the structure of this show actually is, but even if this Western Life performance didn't tell me that, what it did do is the other winning thing, which is it made me incredibly intrigued. And if you're not going to explain your show on the West End Live stage, the best thing you can do is fascinate people to come and find out for themselves. The songs were great. I realized that I could connect to it more than I thought I would. I was worried it would be a little bit inaccessible to me, but it's not. And like I said, one of the most intriguing to me out of all of the performances. So I think they actually did a very good job. Ain't Too Proud performed a couple numbers from the show, and this is an interesting one because they prioritized, I feel like, the most well-known songs. They did My Girl, they did Get Ready, and they gave us that iconic lineup and the choreography but I think there are actually more dynamic numbers, certainly than My Girl, in the show. If they'd done the title song, Ain't Too Proud, or a couple of the other numbers from the show, I think just the slickness and the pace of the choreography would make it a little bit more exciting, because otherwise it starts to be a little bit familiar of a Jersey Boys, of a Beautiful, of the Drifters Girl, of other biopic jukebox musicals that we've seen already on the West End live stage. For people who like that genre, for people who like that music, it's going to be a slam dunk, but then hopefully they would have already bought their tickets prior to this. Then something weird happened. We had Spitting Image Live Idiots Assemble. Now this apparently is a musical and they featured a parody performance of the song We Will Rock You right before the musical We Will Rock You. That was an unfortunate scheduling collision. The puppets were kind of fascinating, if a little bit grotesque, but then that's kind of the entire point. I'm not sure that many musical theatre fans necessarily knew what to make of this, but again, it brought it into their consciousness where this was a show they probably wouldn't have gone out of their way to find out about previously. I don't know if the number sold it particularly well. I don't know if that's the strongest number in the show. I mean, the image of Queen Elizabeth II playing the electric guitar, that's one that's going to stick in my brain, but I just don't think the lyric itself, We Will Rule You, was a particularly clever or funny one. I don't know, maybe there genuinely are no other songs in that show that would work better for a West End Live setting, but I struggle to believe that. Then we actually had We Will Rock You, and we had Elena Sky performing Somebody to Love. I was kind of surprised that they didn't do more songs from the show. A few years ago, We Will Rock You was touring, and they performed at West End Live, and they gave us a much more extended and expanded set, and I Either of Radio Gaga or We Will Rock You would get crowd choreography going on, so it felt odd not to tap into that possibility as well. But it was a great performance of Somebody to Love, there was a little bit of negotiation going on with the backing track, but again, very difficult setting for performers, and I thought Elena Sky did a fantastic job, and she sounded phenomenal. Then we had Back to the Future. I like that they gave us a different number to the ones they'd done before. They brought out Amber Davies to sing There's Something About That Boy. Again, a little bit of negotiation going on with the backing track at the beginning, but she brought it back and she sold the number to me. We then had Put Your mind to it, with alternate Marty McFly, Will Haswell leading, and then back in time to finish. It's difficult for a Back to the Future because the songs are not the strongest selling point of this show. It's very much the effects on stage and how they take a science fiction film and astonishingly put it on stage before our eyes and achieve these things in real life in a theatrical setting. But I think they chose decent songs. The one thing I will say is they weren't in costume, and I think especially with that first number, if they were all in their like period costumes, that that would have given it just a little little bit more impact. If he had looked like Marty McFly, that's an iconic costume, it's an iconic visual, and if there was anyone left who loved that film and hadn't already seen it, then seeing those characters in those costumes performing those songs would have got them very excited to see the show, wouldn't it? We then had two performances from Death Note the Musical. Because of the sound at West End Live, it's not the best setting to really showcase new material that you haven't heard before, but it intrigued me because it gave me two very different flavours from within this one score, something a little bit more dramatic and brooding, then something more up-tempo with a rap section. Francis Mayler McCann was rapping, wasn't expecting that. It may not have sold me all the way on the material, but I was intrigued. And this is promoting a concert that has already managed to sell out 
a night at the London Palladium, so this is pretty much a victory lap in terms of advertising for Death Note. The Time Traveller's Wife also performed, so we had our two presenters from Saturday, Hiba El Sheikh and Tim Mahendran, returning to the West End live stage to perform their kind of funny and sassy duet that they do in the show. It was nice to have them featured. We also had the show's stars, David Hunter and Joanna Woodward. They each gave us a solo performance. Now, I got to go to a press launch of this show a little while ago, and they performed seven songs from the show at this event. And I'm very intrigued that the ones they chose to do at West End Live are very much the tonally happier ones. There are bigger numbers and more impactful numbers, and my favorite stuff from the press launch, which was the meatier, heavier, darker and more intense stuff, they chose not to bring that to West End Live. And it was probably a decent choice to have happy, hilarious, charming David Hunter coming out and singing a fun song rather than an angsty, brooding one. But I think it played more into, oh, we're really enjoying this thing that's happening right now on this stage, more so than, oh, this is a show that I want to book tickets to. And this is where it's difficult to balance those two ideas at West End Live. Do you try and cater to what's gonna play best to the crowd on the day right there? Or do you try and do something that's going to create more intrigue about the show, about the product you're selling? And Time Traveler's Wife really have to think about that decision because they are a show that is opening later this year. They are definitely trying to sell tickets. We had a performance from Showstopper the Improvised Musical. I've seen Showstopper at least twice. If you know nothing about Showstopper, it's these very talented improvisers who will create a completely new musical based on audience suggestions. And on the West End live stage, they ended up making a plot about one of the cameramen, one of the BSL interpreters, and one of the audience members using thematic suggestions from the audience. I think it was Six and Wicked and Les Mis, which are fan favorite musicals, I get it, but also West End live audience. We can come up with some more interesting niche suggestions for musicals for Showstopper. It seemed like a lot of fun. It seemed like it went down really well there's always one act at West End Live that really tries to do something with audience participation. In previous years, it's been Gatsby trying to get everyone to do a Charleston competition and give away tickets to the show. But I think having Showstopper featured is actually very clever and it shows off what they can do in a really short space of time. I'm not convinced that every single song they did sounded completely like the genre they were trying to emulate. The Six one in particular sounded just like modern. It sounded somewhere between Six and Hamilton and it wasn't completely specific. And I think specificity is what wins the day in those kinds of situations, but I love that they did include the real people and Marco, the BSL interpreter and the camera guy. I thought it was very charming. And in any case, every musical theater fan should go see Showstopper at some point in their lives. We had another drag act performing, Queens with a Z, the show with balls. I've seen them at West End Life before and I was very ready to just write them off as another mid-afternoon filler. And I thought they were actually really strong and really talented. And this year they have honed that West End Life performance even more to give you something more cohesive, uh, something a little bit more structured and polished. And I think it was a really professionally put together presentation that they made at West End Live. My one thing about it was I wish it had played a little bit more into the musical theatre fandom. It was just kind of like generic drag music. They did This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. That's about as musical theatre as we got. And they also did Proud Mary. Like there were three different Proud Marys at West End Live this year. It was the year of Proud Mary. I just think give us a little bit more musical theatre. Know your audience. That's what the West End Live audience wants. Oh, I've got four left. I'm nearly there. We had a performance from Treason. I saw this show in concert last year at Theatre Royal Drury Lane. They performed at the West End Live stage before, only then they had the weight of the London Musical Theatre Orchestra on stage behind them. This time they just had a backing track behind them. It gave you as much of a sense of the show as they've given you before. It was another pair of musical theatre ballads. It was stirring and dramatic. I think the second one is called The Inevitable, and that is a really great song, so they're doing a good job to keep wheeling that out. It was great to show off the new cast and kind of build some hype ahead of the show's return later this year, but I don't know if they really matched the the impact that they've made at West End Live before. Largely because Carrie Hope Fletcher was performing the song before and I think people paid a little bit more attention because she has a really big fan base. That's not to say it wasn't sung just as well this time around, but it wasn't giving us anything we didn't already know about the show. For people attending West End Live for the first time this year, they may have felt very differently. Then we had Babies. I got to go and see a workshop presentation of this a few weeks ago and I really love this show. I think the score is fantastic. I think it's a really great concept and I think young musical theatre 
theatre fans don't know how obsessed they're about to be with this show. So I was thrilled to see them at West End Live, perfect setting for them to really start connecting with their future fan base. Uh, the songs they performed were Babies and Hot Dad, which works so well for this setting because it's the kind of like a boy band parody joke song, which worked perfectly on the West End Live stage. It was a hybrid of cast members from previous workshops, but I thought they did a great job. They were wearing the school uniforms, they had the baby props, they did the baby mic drop at the end. I thought it was great. It lends itself very well to a West End Live setting. I'm so glad that they made the decision to be there, even though they don't have like a run of the show to promote at the moment. I think they're laying the foundation for some future success with this show very sensibly. Good producing. Then we had Ride, one of my favorite shows that I've been talking about a lot on my channel. It's about to make its London return at the Southern Playhouse Elephant, and we had returning star Liv Andrusier joined by a new cast member alongside her playing Martha. And we started with the song Ride, which was absolutely the song to start with. It is such an enduring melody. I have had it in my head for years, and so I think doing that on West End Live, a lot of people will be hearing that song for the first time. That's exactly the right decision for them to make because people will get that song stuck in their head and they will start to get obsessed with that show, just like I did. They then did She Rides the Moment, and I think it's because they wanted to feature both of them and feature a Martha and Annie moment, and I get that. And then right towards the end of that, they sort of medleyed it into Everybody Loves a Lie. I think they could have just done Everybody Loves a Lie as the second song, to be honest, but the second song barely matters when Ride was the one that they really needed to do. I liked that we were seeing a little bit of new costuming. I liked that they'd written some specific dialogue around the West End Live appearance trying to sell the show. Sometimes shows don't need to work so hard with like pitching to West End Live. Sometimes people just want to escape into the world of your show and not feel like the show is coming to you. Go on the West End Live stage and, and just create the world of that show without feeling like you need to address the audience. It was cute that they changed one of the lyrics to Hello, West End Live! And impressive that they then rewrote the subsequent two lines to keep the triple rhyme intact. I appreciate that. And finally, we have the SpongeBob musical. Now they sent Irfan Damani, Chrissy Beamer, and Louis Cornet as Sandy, Patrick, and SpongeBob. They sang a trio of songs. They started with Chrissy doing Chop to the top and the energy that Chrissy Beamer brings to a stage. Perfect for West End Live. She should perform at West End Live every single year. There's an alternate version of the universe in which she might have been performing at West End Live this year with the cast of Cinderella because she was meant to replace Carrie Hope Fletcher before the show was abruptly closed in the West End. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Spongebob because they were fantastic. You could tell they were having so much fun. They were hilarious. I was losing my mind for a moment when I wasn't sure if they were going to do Not A Simple Sponge because it is far and away the best song in that show, but then they did, and Lewis did a great job, the audience were loving it, and then they ended perfectly by rocking out to the SpongeBob SquarePants theme tune. Everyone was singing along in the crowd, and they were just so silly and wonderful on stage, just giving it like big rock star energy, dancing along and jumping up and down to the SpongeBob theme. Honestly, one of my favorites to watch back on YouTube. They they just gave me so much joy. Woo! And those have been my thoughts on all of the performances this year at West End Live. I am warm, I am exhausted, but that was a lot of fun talking through all of those performances. I hope that you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. And if you want to see more of my content, if you want to see it before everyone else and some exclusive content as well, you can click on the link in the description and sign up to become a channel member. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe!